professor. We will have uh, comments by uh, Prio and the University of Oslo's uh, Forward Hegre, as well as the Norwegian Broadcasting Company's Jun Paul. This year's Prio annual piece address is the third in a series, and when we get to the number three, it's already a tradition. <laughs> We've uh, had uh, two previous uh, such lectures, one by Jon Elster, who I believe would be in the room, on justice, truth, and peace. Last year's uh, lecture was by uh, U.S. Congressman John Lewis on the role of nonviolence in the struggle for liberation. Widely different, but both widely inspiring and also thought-provoking contributions. And uh, I'm sure today's contribution will be equally inspiring and thought-provoking. I uh, would want to welcome each and every one of you very much to today's event. I want to, in particular, welcome the uh, members of the audience who represent the uh, board of directors of the Peace Research Endowment. The Peace Research Endowment is uh, an entity that uh, PRIO has initiated in the United States uh, to serve both as a forum for intellectual exchange for inspiring the agenda of peace research, not unlike, in fact, the purpose of today's lecture, but also for contributing to resource uh, the execution of that very resource, research agenda. So, uh, welcome to you, and welcome to everybody. Uh, the proceedings today will be uh, taken care of by uh, my dear colleague, Henrik uh, Syse. Henrik is uh, a researcher here at uh, PRIO uh, and a number of other things. Uh, he will lead us through the seminar today and uh, we will uh, uh, reconvene after the proceedings here in the adjacent hall but we'll come back to the practical details. For now we want to wish you a warm welcome first with warming up with a little bit of uh, entertainment. Oh. 
Ladies and gentlemen, such a fantastic group of people who have come here, so it's hard to single out any in particular. But I'd still like to welcome again the Board of the Peace Research Endowment at Creo. Or you're not just at Creo, you should be working for peace in the whole world. It's great to have you here. And I may take a personal special chance to welcome my students from Jötnes College. Good to see you. <laughs> but it's good to have every one of you here, a great gathering of diplomats, academics, and other public figures. And we are looking forward to today's event. What you just heard was one of Norway's leading vocal ensembles called Ensemble 96, nominated for not less than two Grammys, and also singing in many venues in Norway and elsewhere. I have the pleasure of hearing them in my local church, and I can assure you that Easter Sunday this year was like no other Easter Sunday. <laughs> to top it all off, Paul Hager, who will speak later today, is a member of Ensemble 96. He's only talking today, not singing, but that at least means that the choir is assuredly peer-reviewed. <laughs> we they just sang uh, a wedding march from Val, so if you would like to do it, do that. And they also sang um, Music for a While by Henry Purcell. Now today's actual procedures. It's great to be arranging this peace address for the third time. It's a great story that goes around about Winston Churchill, who once got two letters for the opening night of George Bernard Shaw's new play from George Bernard Shaw himself. And it said, here are two tickets for my new play, for you and a friend, if you have one. <laughs> Churchill sent them back and wrote, I'm sorry I cannot come on the opening night, but I'll come on the second night, if there is one. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least we have made sure there is one. And we are so glad to have you. An address can mean two things. It's something you address to someone, such as a speech or a lecture, and it's the place where you take residence. A funny variant of the old saying, show me your friends and I will tell you who you are, says, Show me your address and I will tell you where you live. <laughs> now, joking aside, the real question is, of course, whether peace can ever take root, truly reside in a place, so that it becomes a feature of the way in which people live. Has such a state ever existed in history? Or are we on our way there now? Professor Oscar Gott is one of the world's foremost war historians. And he has tried to answer whether peace is a natural condition of mankind, that we have somehow squandered and destroyed in our so-called state of civilization what Jean-Jacques Rousseau claimed, or whether it's the other way around, that mankind has had a very uneasy relationship to peace, being deeply immersed in war, war and violence, and that only now, with the gradual development of institutions, interdependence, and new rules, are we managing to steer away from war. It's a key question for institutions such as PRIO. Our aim is to produce research that throw light, throws light on the preconditions for peace, and to have you help us with that is indeed a great pleasure. Azar Gat is currently Eliezer Weizmann Professor of National Security and in his second term as Chair of the Department of Political Science at Tel Aviv University. He has been Alexander von Humboldt Fellow at the University of Freiburg in Germany, Fulbright Fellow at Yale, British Council Scholar at Oxford, 
visiting fellow at the Merchant Center at Ohio State University, Golden Visiting Israeli Fellow Professor at Georgetown University, and Correct Distinguished Visiting Fellow for Israel Studies at the Hoover Institution at Stanford. You have been many places, and now you're here. We're hoping that will be added to the CV. <laughs> Gus's 2006 book, War in Human Civilization, was named one of the best books of the year by the Times Literary Supplement. His publication list is long, but you can read that, so I won't say anything more now, except give the floor to Professor Osman. Per, 
per 35 square miles. Among the lowest there is conflict and deadly fighting were the rule. Much of that fighting centered on, on the water holes, vital for survival in this area. The shields, the shields with the, which the Australian Aboriginals carry were not used for hunting kangaroos. In most other places, hunting territories were monopolized and fiercely de defended by hunter-gatherers because they were quickly depleted. The Kalahari Bushmen were the focus of study in the Russoite 1960s and were celebrated as peaceful. Yet it was soon discovered that before the imposition of state authority, they had they had had four times the 1990 U.S. violent mortality rate, which was itself by far the highest in the developed world. Even among the Inuit of Arctic Canada, who were so sparse as to experience no resource competition, fighting to kidnap women was pervasive, re resulting in a violent death rate ten times higher than the United States' 1990 rate. The great microcosms of primitive agriculturists Agriculturalists, which are Highland New Guinea and Amazonia, similarly reveal incessant fighting and a very high violent death rate indeed. On the basis of data from dozens of pre state society, societies, it emerges that violent mortality dropped from a staggering estimated average of 15% of the population, 25% of the men in pre state society societies with all the surviving men covered with scars to about 1 to 5 percent in historical state societies. The main reason for this drop was the enforcement of internal peace by the state Leviathan. Hobbes was right in claiming that anarchy is the most significant cause of violent mortality. A second reason for the steep drop in fighting casualties with the emergence of the state is less obvious and less recognized. The size of states and their armies was larger, often much larger, than that of tribal groups that had preceded them, creating a spectacular impression of large-scale fighting for state wars. States' wars look big and they are big in absolute terms. However, the main question is not absolute but relative casualty. What percentage of the population died violently? And relative casualties actually decreased under, this, under the state precisely because states were large. Large states meant, meant lower mobilization rates and a lesser exposure of the, of the civilian population to war than was the case with tribal groups. Take Egypt, for example, one of the earliest large states and empires. The size of the Egyptian army with which Pharaoh Ramses II fought the Hittite Empire at the Battle of Kadesh in 13th century BC in northern Syria was 20 to 25,000 soldiers. This was a very large army by the standards of the time. Yet the total population of Egypt was about 2 to 3 million. So the army constituted about 1% of, of the population at most. This was very much the standard in large states and empires throughout history because of the great financial and logistical problems of maintaining large armies for long periods at great distances from home. Thus, in comparison to the high military participation rates of small-scale private societies, participation rates, and hence war casualties, in large states' armies were much lower. Moreover, in contrast to the great vulnerability of women and children in small-scale tribal warfare, the civilian population of Egypt was sheltered by, distant, by distance from the theaters of military operations and not often exposed to the horrors of war. Such relative security, interrupted only by large-scale invasion, is one of the main reasons why societies experience great demographic growth after the emergence of the state. It is also the reason why civil war, where the war wages within the country, tends to be the most lethal form of war, as Hobbes very well realized. Thus, the rise of the state meant bigger, more spectacular war, but by and large, fewer casualties relative to the population. The 
second major step in the decline of war after the rise of the state Leviathan has occurred with the modern industrial age during the past two centuries. Most people are surprised to learn that the occurrence of war and overall mortality rate in war sharply decrease after 1815, especially in the developed world. The so-called long peace among the great powers after 1945 is more recognized and is widely attributed to the nuclear factor, a decisive factor to be sure, which concentrated the minds of all the protagonists wonderfully, as they say about the hanging, the hanging rope. The interdemocratic peace has been equally recognized. However, the decrease in war has been very marked even before the nuclear era and has encompassed non-democracies as well as democracies. In the century after 1815, wars among economically advanced countries declined in their frequency to about a third of what they had been in the previous centuries, an unprecedented change. In fact, the long peace after 1945, 67 years today, was preceded by the second longest peace ever among the modern great powers between 1871 <coughs> and 1914, 43 years and by the third longest peace between 1815 and 1854, 39 years. Thus, the three longest periods of peace by far in the modern great power system have all occurred after 1815, with the first two taking place before the nuclear age. This striking phenomenon cannot be accidental. Clearly, one needs to explain the entire period of reduced belligerency since 1815, while also accounting for the two glaring divergences from the trend, the two world wars. There is a tendency to assume that wars have declined in frequency during the past two centuries because they have become too lethal, destructive, and expensive. That was what... Uh, that would be the instinctive um, theory of, of most people. This hypothesis barely holds, however, because relative to population and wealth, wars have not become more lethal and costly than earlier in history. The wars of the 19th century, the most peaceful century in European history, were in fact particularly light in comparative terms. True, the world wars, especially World War II, were cert certainly on the upper scale of the range in terms of casualties. Yet contrary to widespread assumptions, they were far from being exceptional in history. Once more, we need to look at relative casualties, general mortality rates in war, rather than at the aggregates created by the fact that many states participated in the world wars. A few examples will, will suffice to demonstrate that pre-modern wars were not less deadly and destructive than modern wars. In the first three years of the Second Punic War, to, to 18 to 16 BC, Rome lost some 50,000 male citizens of the ages 17 to 46, out of a total of about 200,000 in these ages. This was roughly 25% of the military age cohorts in only three years, <coughs> the same range as the Russian military casualties and higher than the German rates in World War II. Similarly, in the 13th century, the Mongol conquest inflicted on the societies of Eurasia casualties and destruction that were among the highest ever suffered during historical times. Estimates of the sharp decline experienced by the population of China and Russia, for example, vary. Still, even by the lowest estimates, they were at least as great, and in China almost definitely far greater, than the Soviet Union horrific rate in World War II of about 15% of its population. A final example, during the 30 years war, population loss in Germany is estimated at at between a fifth and a third. Either way, higher than the German casualties in the First and Second World War wars combined. No 
how is it true that wars during the past two centuries have become economically more costly than they were earlier in history? Again, relative to overall wealth. War always involved massive economic extension and was the single most expensive item of state spending. Both 16th, century, 16th and 17th century Spain and 18th century France, for example, were economically ruined by war and staggering war debts, which in the French case brought about the revolution. Furthermore, death by starvation in pre-modern pre wars was widespread. Thus, pre-modern wars were neither less deadly nor less costly or ruinous than the modern breed. Another strength of interpretation of the perceived decrease in warfare during recent times has posited voluntary and idyllic factors attribut attributing the decline to a social attitude change towards war. Why this, why this attitude change should have occurred at this point in history rather than in any time earlier is not explained. After all, most powerful moral doctrines, such as Buddhism and Christianity, decried war for millennia without this having any noticeable effect. It is, it is suggested that people have suddenly become aware that war is senseless, if not crazy, devoid of any rationale. Such a view of war is widespread in today's modern and affluent world. But try this idea on Genghis Khan, whose descendants constitute, according to a genetic study, 8% of all males in Eastern and Central Asia, evidence of staggering sexual opportunities enjoyed by his sons and grandsons whose houses rule over that part of the world for centuries. Lest it be thought, as it often is, that only autocrats and military aristocracy profited from war while the people were its unwilling, un unwilling victims, it ought to be remembered that the two most successful war-making city-states of classical antiquity were democratic Athens and Republican Rome. And they were so successful precisely because the people of these polities benefited from war and imperial expansion, championed them, and enlisted in their cause. Moreover, throughout history, people were often fearing and lamenting war as often enthusiastic enthusiastically said its glory and the glory of its heroes. In pursuit of their aims, people may resort to cooperation, peaceful competition, or violent conflict. Each of these behavioral strategies is a well-designed tool interchangeably employed depending on the particular circumstances as prospects of success. Thus, to understand the gravitation of human choices and norms from violent conflict to, towards the non-violent options of cooperation and peaceful competition, one needs to understand the changing circumstances and calculus of cost-effectiveness during the past two centuries and in recent decades. <laughs> Indeed, if war have not become more costly and destructive during the past two centuries, and an attitude change against war has not just sprung out of thin air, why have wars receded, particularly in the developed world? Even before the middle of the 19th century, thinkers such as Saint-Simon, Auguste Comte, John Stuart Mill, and the Manchester School, who were quick to note the change, realized that it was caused by the advent of the Industrial Commercial Revolution, the most profound transformation of human societies since the, the Neolithic adoption of agriculture. In the first place, given explosive growth in per capita wealth, about 30 to 54 from the onset of the revolution to the present, the Malthusian trap has been broken. Wealth no longer constitutes a fundamentally finite quantity when the only question is how it is divided, so wealth acquisition progressively shifted away from a zero-sum game. Secondly, economies are no longer overwhelmingly autarkic, having become increasingly interconnected by specialization, scale, and exchange. 
consequently, foreign devastation potentially depresses the entire system and is thus detrimental to a state's own well-being. Thirdly, greater economic openness has decreased the likelihood of war by disassociating economic excess from the confine of political borders and sovereignty. It is no longer necessary to politically possess a, a, a territory in order to benefit from it. Of all these factors, commercial interdependence has attracted most of the attention in the scholarly literature, but the other two factors have been no less significant. Thus, the greater the yield of competitive economic cooperation, the more counter the more counterproductive and less attractive conflict becomes. Rather than, more, rather than war becoming more costly, as is widely believed, it is in fact peace that has been growing more profitable. If so, why have war continued to occur during the past two centuries, albeit at a much lower frequency? In the first place, ethnic and nationalist tension often overrode the logic of the new economic realities, according, accounting for most wars in Europe between 1815 and, and 1945. They continue to do so today, especially in the less developed parts of the world. Moreover, the, log the logic of the new economic realities receded during the late 19th century and early 20th centuries as the great powers resumed protectionist policies and expanded them to the undeveloped parts of the world with the new imperialism. <coughs> this development signaled that the emergent global economy might become partitioned rather than open, with each imperial domain becoming closed to everybody else. As indeed they eventually did in the 1930s. A snowball effect ensued generating a runaway grab for imperial territories. For the territorially confined Germany and Japan, the need to break, a, to, the need to break away into imperial Lebensraum, Lebensraum or co-prosperity sphere seemed particularly pressing. Here lay the seeds of the two world wars. Furthermore, the retreat from economic liberalism in the first decades of the 20th century sparked and was sparked by the rise to power of anti-liberal and anti-democratic political ideology, ideologies and regimes incorporating a creed of violence, communism and fascism. Since 1945, the decline of major war has deepened further. Nuclear weapons have been a crucial factor in this deep, deepening process, but no less significant have been the institu institu oh, excuse me. <laughs> institutionalization of free trade and the closely related process of rapid and sustained economic growth. The spread of liberal democracy has been equally potent. Indeed, although <coughs> non-liberal and non-democratic states also became much less belligerent during the industrial age, it is the liberal democracies that have been the most attuned to its pacifying aspects. Relying on arbitrary coercive force at home, non-democratic countries have found it more natural to use force abroad. By contrast, liberal democratic societies are socialized to peaceful, law-mediated relations at home, and the citizens have gone to expect that the same norms be applied internationally. Living in increasingly tolerant societies, they have grown more receptive of the other's point of view. Promoting freedom, legal equality and political participation domestically, liberal democratic powers, though initially in possession of vast empires, have found it increasingly difficult to justify ruling over foreign people without their consent. And sanctifying life, liberty, and human rights, they have proven to be failures in forceful suppression. Furthermore, with the individual life and pursuit of happiness elevated above group values, sacrifice of life in war has increasingly lost legitimacy in liberal democratic societies. Rome, war retained legitimacy only under narrow and narrowing 
formal and practical condition and is generally view, viewed as extremely abhorrent and undesirable. The fruits of these deepening trends and sensibilities have been nothing short of miraculous. The probability of war between ethnic democracies and it has declined to a vanishing point where they no longer even see the need to prepare for the possibility of a militarized dispute with one another. The security dilemma between neighbors, that seemingly intrinsic feature of international anarchy, no longer exists, most notably in North America and Western Europe, the world's most modernized and liberal democratic regions. With the collapse of the Soviet Union and rapid economic growth coupled with democratization in Eastern Europe, East and South Asia and Latin America, the prospect of a major war within the developed world seems to have become very remote. World's geographical center of gravity has shifted radically. The modernized, economically developed parts of the world have become a zone of peace. World now appears to be confined to the less developed part of the globe, the world's zone of war, where countries that have lagged behind in modernization and in, in its pacifying spin-off effects occasionally still fight among themselves, themselves as well as with developed countries. And yet, having so far delineated the causes of the sharp decrease in war and the spread of peace during modernity, modernity and in recent and in recent decades, it's time to emphasize that this hugely improved and improving condition is far from being foolproof and free from shadows and major challenges. The euphoric post-Cold War moment may have turned out to be a fleeting one with the new world order threatened by new disorders. Perhaps the most significant challenge is the return of capitalist non-democratic brain powers, a regime type that has been absent from the international system since the defeat of Germany and Japan in 1945. The massive growth of formerly communist and fast industrializing authoritarian capitalist China represents the greatest change in the global balance of power. Russia, too, has retreated from its post-communist liberalism and has assumed an increasingly authoritarian character. Will these powers eventually democratize with development is perhaps the most crucial question of the 21st century. The lessons of history are not as clear about the inevitability of the process as progressivists, recently and most famously Fukuyama, tend to believe. Furthermore, since the outbreak of the economic crisis, the authoritarian great powers have gained much in confidence, while the hegemony and the prestige of democratic capitalism have suffered massive blow unparalleled since the 1930s. One hopes that the, recent, that the current economic crisis will not be nearly as catastrophic. And yet, the global allure of state-driven and nationalist capitalist authoritarianism may grow substantially. At the same time, American might, the main reason not sufficiently appreciated for the triumph of democracy in the 20th century, is undergoing relative decline, though probably not as steep as it is sometimes imagined. Deeply integrated into the world economy, the new capitalist authoritarian powers partake of the de development open trade capitalist peace, but not of the liberal democratic one. The, mo the democratic and non-democratic powers may coexist more or less peacefully, armed because of mutual fear and suspicion, but there is also the prospect of more, of more antagonistic relations, accentuated ideological rivalry, potential and actual conflict, intensified arms races, and even new cold wars. China and Russia's support for oppressive regime around the world, most notably today Syria and Iran, may be the, the foretaste of things to come. A second conspicuous exception to the reduction of belligerency has been, has been the persistence over the past two decades of limited wars by mostly the United States and, in that, and its NATO allies, with far more backward rivals, little affected by either modernization or democracy. 
counterinsurgency warfare in particular has, has drawn a great deal of attention and criticism and indeed constitutes an enigma. Mighty powers that proved capable of crushing the strongest great power uh, opponents failed to defeat the humblest of military rivals in some of the world's poorest and weakest regions. It has barely not been noted, however, that rather than being universal, this difficulty has overwhelmingly been the lot of liberal democratic powers and encountered precisely because they are liberal and democratic. Much of the democracy's conduct in this respect, the butt of heavy, criti of heavy criticism, may actually be regarded as a badge of honor for them. Historically, the crushing of an insurgency necessitated ruthless pressure on the civilian population, which liberal democracies have found increasingly unacceptable. Suppression is the sine qua non of imperial rule. The British and French Empire could sustain themselves at relative low cost only so long as the imperial powers felt no scruples about it, applying ruthless measures. However, as liberalization deepened from the late 19th century, the days of formal democratic empires became numbered even while outwardly they were reaching their greatest, their greatest extent. It has scarcely been noticed that the massive wave of decolonization after 1945 took place only vis-à-vis -vis the liberal democratic empires, most, no most notably Britain and France. The non-democratic empires, far, far from being made to be withdraw by indigenous resistance, were either crushed in the two world wars, as with Germany and Japan, or dismantled peacefully when the totalitarian system disintegrated, as with the Soviet Union. Skeptics might cite the successful guerrilla waged against Nazi Germany and Yugoslavia and the Soviet Union. However, there can be little doubt that had Germany won the Second World War and been able to apply more troops to these troubles, troublesome spots, its genocidal methods would have prevailed there too. The Soviet Union failure in Afghanistan is an obvious counterexample, but Afghanistan was the exception the outlier rather than the rule in the Soviet imperial system. Chechnya may be more enlightening in this respect, and the sequence is unmistakable. Soviet methods under study, including mass deportation, were the most brutal and most effective in curbing resistance, while even Russia of the 1990s proved to be the least brutal and least effective, with Putin's authoritarian Russia constituting an intermediate case. It, indeed, it is in fact the comparative ease with which the empire was held down within the Soviet Union itself and in Eastern Europe that is worthy of attention. For as Sherlock Holmes has noted, it is the dog that didn't bark. The imperial domain lying helpless under the totalitarian iron, iron fist that are the most conspicuous and most steady. The same applies to China whose continued successful suppression of Tibetan and Muslim nationalism is likely to persist so long as China retains its non-democratic regime. People point to the brutality of the Assad regime and its failure to suppress the insurrection in Syria. The tragedy in Syria constitute, uh, continues for a year and a half now and is estimated to have cost the lives of over 20,000 people. And yet, the elder Assad inflicted a similar number of casualties in three days when suppressing the Muslim Brotherhood's uprising in the city of Hama in 1982. <laughs> Thus, despite undeniable brutalities and policy mistake, mistakes, the democracy's counterinsurgency war record is very much a testimony to their noblest qualities. This is surely the case with the humanitarian intervention which inevitably encountered the same intractable problems just described, which indeed partly detail such intervention. Still, foreign intervention has risen also in response to yet another shadow hanging over the decline of belligerency, and that is unconventional terror. 
The September 11, 2001 mega terror attacks in the United States constitute a landmark in history, not so much in and of themselves, but in demonstrating an ominous potential that, it, that is yet to unravel. This is the threat of unconventional terror employing weapons of mass destruction, nuclear, biological, and chemical. Of these chemical weapons are the least dangerous, while biological weapons have the greatest potential. The revolutionary breakthroughs in the decipherment of the genome and in biotechnology open up new horizons in terms of lethality and accessibility. A virulent laboratory cultivated strain of bacteria or virus, let alone a specially, a specially engineered superbug against which no immunization exists, might bring the lethality of biological weapons within the range of nuclear attacks, while being far more easily accessible to, ter to terrorists than nuclear weapons. Fortunately, in contrast to chemical and biological agents, terrorism cannot produce nuclear weapons. That yet they might obtain them, yet they might obtain them from those who can. At the root of the problem is the trickling down to below the state level of the technologies and materials of mass killing. The greatest threat of nuclear proliferation into countries, countries with low security standards and high levels of corruption is the far increased danger of leakage. In the most famous case today, Abdul Kader Khan, the Pakistani scientist who headed this country's nuclear weapon program, sold the nuclear secrets to perhaps a dozen countries. Furthermore, states in the less developed and unstable parts of the world are ever in danger of disintegrating, of disintegration and anarchy. When state authority collapses and uh, anarchy takes hold, who is to guarantee the, the country's nuclear arsenal? Again, Pakistan is a much discussed case. Indeed, the collapsed Soviet Union, rather than the former nuclear superpower, may be the, may be the model for future threats. Scenarios of world threatening individuals and organizations previously reserved, reserved to fiction of the James Bond genre suddenly become real. Because the term based on mutual, mutual assured destruction scarcely applies to terrorists, the use of, of ultimate weapons is more likely to come from them than it is from states. Unconventional capability acquired by terrorists is usable. Indeed, once the potential exists, it is difficult to see what will stop it from materializing somewhere, sometime. This is a baffling problem which does not lend itself to easy or clear solutions. International cooperation against proliferation in the and in the pursuit of terrorists is essential, but quite a number of states either actively work against it or stand on the sidelines. Foreign mili military intervention remained highly controversial and fraught with difficulties. As this event takes place, military action against the nuclear nuclearizing Iran by either Israel or the United States may be in the cards and may escalate into war with major consequences for the world. Defensive measures are almost as problematic as the preemptive, especially in the democracies. Detainment of suspects by means of extraordinary legal procedure, debriefing methods, Surveillance of people and communication and other infringements of privacy are hotly debated in liberal democracies. Regarding both the offensive and defensive elements of the war on terror, this debate assumes a bitterly ideological and righteous character, and yet the threat of unconventional terrorism is real, is here to stay, and it offers no easy solutions. We are clearly experiencing the, the most peaceful times in history by far, a, strike, a strikingly blissful and deeply grounded trend. And it is also true that this is also the, the most dangerous world ever, with people for the first time possessing the ability to destroy themselves completely, and even individual and small group gaining the ability to cause mass death. Proverbially, predictions are just fine as long as, as they are not applied to the future. 
as trends may, ch as trends may change direction or interact differently <coughs> over time. Indeed, only time will tell. We can only hope that despite ups and downs, the general trends will endure and will deepen the peace for and in our time. With a possible objection from the waves of the ocean, we all aspire that the entire world will be more like Norway. <laughs> Thank you very much. masterful and rich address indeed. Uh, there's a Swedish saying that says it's not enough to be on the right track if you just sit there. <laughs> you somehow have to be in motion and uh, you are pointing out some things that have happened in the world, some trends that are quite clear, but also some questions for the future. If I may be lighthearted for just one small second, you may think that it's quite arbitrary what's up there, but this is actually peace rising slowly and then suddenly falling down, <laughs> the danger that you have portrayed in very clear terms. Now, we will hear more music. We are very, very happy to have Ensemble 96 back singing for us, and quite fittingly, they will now sing about peace.
And so you got caught up, up in that more extrovert twin on foreign policy research, namely foreign policy reporting. She has become a deeply respected reporter, working as a journalist, a correspondent, foreign policy editor, and chief news editor for the Norwegian public broadcasting system. She is today back in journalism proper, still for the NRK, Norwegian public broadcasting, as chief foreign news commentator. She has just come back from Afghanistan just to be with us here. So it's my great pleasure to give the floor to our first commentator today, Hugh Hall. Excellencies, director and staff of Rio, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor to be invited to comment on the annual peace address. Uh, and I enjoy very much uh, to listen to Azagat. Uh, it's difficult to be come after him, but I will try my very best. Being just a humble journalist, uh, albeit as Henrik uh, told about, with a couple of years studying politi politics and history, uh, I will just have to accept as a starting point uh, what Gat has spent so much of his, his life to prove, uh, namely that war has been decreasing uh, and peace expanding, at least relative to the number of casualties and our generated wealth. Certainly, having to familiarize myself with his arguments and theories has been inspiring, thought-provoking, and demanding because of the span of empirical evidence from thousands of years back uh, up to the present. Uh, this is indeed overwhelming, as are the number of available explanations. Uh, for conflicts and wars. My questions and comments are partly of an empirical nature, partly dealing with his analytical approach as presented in the lecture we just heard. None of them pretend, or my questions and comments, pretend uh, an attempt to falsify his theory, uh, but I hope I'll maybe make it look a little bit less pretty. First, uh, God's theory uh, operates on the extreme macro level, searching for patterns in several thousand years of history. Still, one must expect that his conclusions also find support on the level of the individual actors, the subjects of history, and their motivations. So my question is, did you test these theories uh, against sources telling about history's heroes and anti-heroes' actual motivation. I'm sure they did, but there was not room for it here, but that is of interest. There will always be structural limitations and opportunities determining the field of possibilities, possible outcomes, but within the field, the individual monarch, president, government, or general, uh, or general usually has a range of choices. Sometimes it leads to war, sometimes not. Two examples from history. The outbreak of World War II. It started with the young Bosnians, uh, Bosnian revolutionary, a member of a Serb secret society that killed the heir to the Austrian uh, Hungarian uh, throne, Franz Ferdinand. Austria answered with an ultimatum uh, to Serbia. It demanded that Austrian officials should be permitted to collaborate in the investigation and also in the punishment of those behind the assassination. For this, they had support from Germany and the Serbs refused with the support of Russia and France. And off they went. They arrived into an extremely bloody and costly war, although Norwegian shipbuilders and freighters built themselves fortunes on this war. But it started with a shot and could hardly be said to be inevitable. Uh, certainly, however, World War II was devastating to European economies. Peace would have been more profitable even at that early stage of capitalism in East and Central Europe, I think so. Secondly, uh, as an example of war that didn't happen, but was very close to take place, I think that the Cuba crisis is served well. We know, uh, not least from the then Defense Minister Robert McNamara, 
He recalls that there were strong differences of opinion in the U.S. leadership and that the president's personal anti-war stand became decisive in the end. It is hard to predict where a confrontation between the two military giants would have ended or led the world. Uh, and the attack would certainly have started outside of Soviet and American territory, but it could have become very violent. Secondly, about uh, God's basic assumption that the greater the economic complexity, and this is a quote, the greater the economic complexity and openness, the less likelihood of war between states by this association, uh, economic access from the con confines of decreased political borders and sovereignty. It is no longer necessary, says God, to uh, politically possess a territory in order to benefit from it. More cooperation, less war. Peace has become more profitable. Yes, indeed. But how modern is this? In order to demand taxes, yes, from the population, you need a certain degree of ownership to the land. That's for sure. But exploiting other states' wealth with or without agreements is nothing new. Take the Byzantine Venetian agreement from 1082. Venetian traders were exempted from taxes and given relatively free access in exchange for promises to help in the wars with the Normans, that is, us, among others. This type of trade-offs, privileges for security has been quite normal, uh, even hundreds and thousands of years ago. Peace has been profitable for huge set, set segments of the population for thousands of years, both the peasants and both the peasants who were taxed to, in order to, to uh, make wars or, or finance wars, and those who traded. Thirdly, God himself asked the question, why do we then still have wars? And he answers with, quote, ethnic and nationalist tensions override the logic of new economic realities, accounting for most wars in Europe from 1815 to 1945. Yes. I agree, indeed, about the importance. But in order to keep the aesthetic beauty of a theory, he has to use the word override, picturing it as a deviation from the rule. How sure is it really that uh, the devi about how sure are you about this deviation assumption? And if this is a main source of deviation, ethnic and nationalist tensions, then why are not constitutional and institutional arrangements to stop ethnic and nationalist tensions, tensions from developing into wars uh, uh, a central part of this explanation for peace? I'm just asking, is it too simple to draw a direct causal connection between the new economic realities and relative peace? God uh, describes the, uh, the German need for more Lebensraum for economic growth for the German nation uh, as the seeds for uh, the Second World War. If we take this war, uh, this is indeed to put an extremely heavy accent on the pure economic part of Hitler's motivation. There were, as we know, indeed other and more political parts that were also very important. Further, the dissolution of both the Yugoslav and the Soviet state was devastating for large parts of those elites who benefited from the federations, not to speak about the population. The economies of these states were based on geographical division of labor, and in a few months, both sources of raw material and markets vanished. But the dissolution of the two federations followed very different paths. One accompanied by bloody wars, the other surprisingly peaceful. Why the difference? In short, the internal distribution of and control with military resources was cru crucial, as was the fact that neither of the two Russian rivals wanted war. As the balance of forces was in the autumn of 1991, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics could only have been kept alive with military means against the nationalist aspiration of the 15 Union Republics. Not all of them equally strong, but some of them extremely strong. But the tensions uh, of both Yugoslavia and Soviet Union certainly overrode the logic of 
economic realities as I see it. And uh, from the perspective of the Bulls, um, uh, whom I knew at that time uh, quite well, I traveled there extensively, uh, I learned that how ready they were to sacrifice economical prosperity for the cause of freedom. That was, they were, they knew they were suffering, but still they chose to leave the Union. Next, God says in his lecture that perhaps the most significant challenge is the return of capitalist non democratic great powers, like China and Russia. Further, he insists that it is crucially important that any protectionist turn in the system is avoided to prevent grapple markets. Two critical remarks on this. How does he substantiate that protectionism and the accompanying grapple markets today, in itself, represents a threat to great, uh, so great that it can lead to war? For me, that is difficult to see. Secondly, he cites Russia's support for oppressive regimes as a possible foretaste for things to come. But what about U.S. support for Saudi Arabia and Europe's, including Norway's, and U.S. support for Libya's Gaddafi in the recent years and months before the Arab Spring? That shifted very rapidly. Of the, uh, different reasons, but uh, they were <coughs> quite good friends with Gaddafi just before the Arab Spring. Does this fear of autocratic capitalism, or rather state-driven capitalism, carry any weight at all as an argument? And where are the signs that it poses a larger threat to lives outside their own territory than does the democratic capitalist countries with NATO countries fighting out of area wars for two decades, decades now? Question mark. Before I end, I'll make two points about counterinsurgency. God says, despite undeniable, undeniable the brutality and policy mistakes, the demo, uh, democracy's counterinsurgency war record is very much a testimony to the noblest quality. Is it really so? Has God forgotten the 400,000 killed or maimed by U.S. chemical warfare during 10 years of Vietnam War? According to the Vietnamese Red Cross, uh, one million people still suffer severe health problems caused by Agent Orange and other chemical substances sprayed over the land and people. God rightly speaks about the threat of unconventional terror after 9/11. The fear of terrorists still employing, or the fear of terrorists employing weapons of mass destruction, not with biological and chemical, but no autocrat or other state has used chemical weapons with such devastating results as did the US, USA in Vietnam. Let's not forget that. And how has the heart and mind strategy been successful anywhere? At least not in Afghanistan, which is a country I know better than many others, many other countries, where Taliban is much stronger than in 2002, much stronger than in 2006, and even than in 2010 partly due to failed and over-optimistic perception of the possibilities to buy hearts and minds with cash and aid projects. My point, the counterinsurgency strategy as applied in NATO's largest auto area operation ever in Afghanistan is not a success. On the contrary, and the withdrawal is a result of the domestic political climate in the NATO countries themselves, not some kind of achieved benchmarks on the ground in Afghanistan. So, don't expect quick, um, quick successes with the coin strategies around the world in the future. So, where do the future chances come from? I agree, of course, that civil wars and terror is, they are real challenges. But the reason why 9-11 led to war in 2001, led to war, was not only the attack on US in itself, it was as much the vulnerability of the political leadership in a liberal democracy. Could any democratic government have survived without responding with military means and a strategy for war? In other words, can the causal connection between democracy and war also be just the opposite of what God says? A dictator could, in theory, have restricted himself to a more limited hunt for the guilty and even struck deals that would have been impossible for the U.S. leadership in 2001 and 2002, or for that case, the leadership of any democratic country in Western Europe, I think. So, just think about it. Thank you for the attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kim, for those profound remarks.
some important questions. Uh, it's great. And I also can hear that you are, after all, a political commentator, because you talk about protectionism and war. And we have now the debate in Norway about hard cheeses and red meat and tariffs on those. Maybe that was in the back of your mind, but it won't be anymore, for sure. Now, we have uh, one more commentator, and it's a great pleasure for me to introduce a colleague. Paul Wadega is research professor here at Rio. He's an associate professor of political science at the University of Oslo and an associate editor of the Journal of Peace Research. He is one of the 10 most cited scholars worldwide in research on armed conflict. That's quite impressive, and it's a great thing to be a colleague of someone like that, since I'll never get there, I can say, but one of my colleagues does. It's a little bit like having children. Can you play the piano? No, my daughters do. So that is great for uh, But we know, as your colleague, that there is a lot of work behind this. You have published more than 30 peer-reviewed articles internationally, and especially work on the relationship between economic development, democracy, and armed conflict. It's a great pleasure for me to give the floor to you. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. So, thanks to Hendrik and to Rio for inviting me to comment on uh, the Sovart peace address. Um, and thanks to Professor Gott for his excellent peace address. I'm, first, I should state that I'm deeply impressed by Professor Gott's work. Um, I read his book, War in Human Civilization, a few years back. And together with other studies I've read, and also because he's general argument is consistent with my own research. I'm, I'm fairly entirely convinced that he's right, that we now live in one of the in an unprecedented time of peacefulness, um, despite the appearances. Uh, so, as, as you show that we have come a far away from the state of nature that's uh, described by Thomas Hobbes in his book in 1651. Uh, the f most famous quote from, from that uh, book is, um, that the state of nature is continually fear and danger, violent death, and the life of man, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. So, in my early days at the university, we used to learn about the contrast between Hobbes' view and Rousseau's depictions of the peaceful savage presented in a balanced fashion. The reading list should maybe now be revised a bit. The empirical record, as eloquently presented by God, does not favor the Rousseau. Maybe that should apply to the exam course of humanity at university in more no So I also find Professor God's uh, explanation of these trends quite convincing, partly because they coincide well with what I've been working on myself. Um, um, so I recommend everybody to read this book, which is thick and well written with fascinating accounts of war and historic communion prehistoric times, and extremely well documented. So all that said, I'm, in general, I, I agree with God in most respects and can only scrape a bit on the surface. Um, but I have a few questions to your explanations of these trends. So a core explanation is that the changes in economic structures associated with the modern industrial age increase the benefits of peace much more than the benefits of war. It is, he argues, not because war has become more costly. I, I mostly agree with this, but I'm question, I'd like to question you whether it, this explanation is really so dominant as it appears in the peace address, and maybe I'm oversimplifying your argument a bit in what follows that makes it easier to comment at least. Um, so, my first question relates to your dismissal of ideas as an explanation ideas. Do you refer to the fact that ideas of pacifism have been around for millennia, as reflected in the scripture of Christianity and Buddhism? But you ask, why would all that is suddenly take effect with industrialism? Why, why, why would it happen right now that going at the same time as industrialism? You also state that Genghis Khan can care less about pacifism, even if he knew about it. So, what people do what benefit them, not what they found morally acceptable. But is it possible that it takes time for ideas to spread in the population and might also have to be accepted by majority of that population in order to change the behavior of, of rulers and, and, and the population at large. Um, ideas of pacifism might first be accepted within families and then later be gradually expanded to be applied to the extended family, to the tribe, to the nation, and then being applied universally. That's it. Often that's a long and slow process which, which cannot be dismissed as easily as, as you do, I think. Uh, 
Um, Stephen Pinker has an interesting argument that relating peacefully to, to a large circle of people, like a nation, is an act of reason and therefore requires literacy and education. These literacy and education, they have also spread very slowly. Ideas are most effectively conveyed through education, and Pinker sees the printing revolution starting in the 15th century to be the most important change, or one of the very important changes that you have to dismiss this, or maybe not so explicit as I portray it. So, after the printing revolution, Pinker argues that accounts of the lives and ideas and feelings of distant people became accessible to everyone, effectively expanding the circle of people with which people are able to relate on an equal footing with respect for fundamental rights, more specifically the rights to keep the lives. So, is it possible that ideas might slowly spread in this fashion, gradually becoming so strong that rulers cannot ignore them, and thereby having a causal impact? So, and this question is related to my next question, which is, where did industrialization come from in the first place? And Hobbes actually has an answer to that, issue, that question. He, another quote from Hobbes is that, in the state of nature, in such condition, there is no place for industry because the fruit of all is uncertain, says Hobbes. So, without some sort of guarantee that investment might enjoy the fruit of its efforts, no investments could occur. Without protection of trade routes, no specialization. That is, without peace, no industrial revolution. Or rather, does the evolution of property rights somehow resemble the evolution of peace? Where either powerful state or strong norms make sure that the marginal minority makes make sure that only a marginal minority makes use of violence. There, there will also be criminal elements in the society, but that's in in order that's only a marginal minority. So, um, so the evolution of property rights might. So how did the evolution of property rights and the last industrialization come about in the first place? Is, has that something to do with the evolution of peace? So I'm turning your argument a bit on, on, on its head. Uh, but I admit it's still possible that it's the goal of profit that analyzes this change. Actually, Mansur Olson's argument is only slightly different from yours and consistent with your main empirical narrative which I find quite fascinating. He depicts a transformation from an, an anarchical state of nature, where territories host a number of roving bandits that move around, violently acquiring whatever scant production there is. If one of these roving bandits succeeds in obtaining sufficient dominance in the territory to be the only actor from its producers, a change occurs. That's the emergence of the state, as you described. So violence is reduced. This new stationary bandit is the only one to use violence. But Olsen also notes that since the stationary bandit has a monopoly on robbery, it pays to restrain and formalize his own robbery so that producers retain an incentive to invest in more production. The bandit, or king, as he is now called, can steal a smaller proportion and still become even richer. And actually, Olsen argues that this process continues indefinitely, uh, and as it evolves, the value of being the king becomes less and less profitable compared to other ways to earn money. So, and that takes way for democratization because the proportion of the uh, production that is steel through taxes is so small that there is no strong competition for being the leader of the state. So, um, so that's the second question. Where did industrialization come from? Um, I. I believe that the long-term declining trends you describe are too strong and too consistent to stop just now. So I'm, I tend to be optimistic about the future when it comes to this particular aspect of human behavior. And that's also part of my own research. Uh, but I, I believe it's very important to think, as you do, about the main challenges to this declining trend. And you highlight one particular challenge, which leads to my final question. You said, Perhaps the most significant challenge is the return of capitalism on democratic great powers. Moreover, you state that deeply integrated into the world economy, the new capitalist foreign powers partake of the development of open trade capitalist peace, but not of the liberal democratic one. This argument 
conversing real explanatory power to democratic institutions. I do think that democratic institutions change and send these factories to society, but I some, sometimes wonder how much democracy really can explain uh, this resembles Guru Holmes' uh, question, but my take on it is a bit different. Because what is democracy really? Is it a normative idea specifying that all men are equal and that the dominance of a few at the expense of all others is unjust? And if so, is, if democracy has some causal effect, isn't this idea it has nothing to do with profits? That's another question to you on the side. Or is democracy on a qualified agreement not to use violence to settle disputes, it's only the qualification of peace. So democracy has spread at the same time and in the same parts of the world as war has declined. Europe became gradually industrialized, rich, democratic, and peaceful during the 20th century. Africa is not still, Africa is still not very democratic, it's poor and conflict broke. So, the factors you eloquently describe as driving a decline in war may be the very same that's, as those that stimulate democratization. And this is also Olson's argument. With extensive specialization, holding onto power by means of force is more costly relative to the alternatives than in simpler economies. So, if this is true, that democracy and peace ultimately rely on the same cause of factors, how much of a challenge is capitalism on democracy? True, China has become capitalist, it remains non-democratic, but how many earlier industrializers have maintained that combination? In the long run, can China and Russia really maintain autocratic forms of rule? <coughs> that's an argument. If you take the long view, that's an argument. That's <coughs> what you ask. Maybe the challenge is only a transition problem, that regime changes often are chaotic and violent, that's certainly true. Or do you rather mean going back to Henrik's comments to Ruhamel again, that with capitalist non democratic great powers present, maybe the main challenge is protectionism, which now is more dangerous than ever. So, so despite these questions, I'd like to thank you once more for your brilliant peace address and for extremely valuable contributions to what we know, know about trends and warfare over long time spans. And actually, this argument is a very novel argument in the spirit of so, thank you. Thanks warmly to you as well, Bob, for packing in a lot of really important comments in a short time. I wrote my doctoral dissertation once on Hobbes, so I'm glad to see you being lifted forth here. And certainly, this is not a place where it is solitary, poor, nasty, or brutish, but unfortunately, time is short. So, Professor Osargat, we now have uh, deserved an hour to answer some of these things. You do have five minutes, or as my boss just told me, we'll give him six. <laughs> so, the floor is now, before we finish up in here, yours again. I was sure you, are, you were going to extend my <laughs> time to one hour, but uh, so what should I say in five minutes? <laughs> I can refer you to the book, but that would be too cruel. <laughs> 800 pages. Uh, so, I don't know, where shall we begin? Uh, so I have to pick and choose, and we'll see what, where we get. The, I, I'm not, uh, I don't think that I ideas <coughs> count. I started as an intellectual historian. Obviously, ideas count. The uh, positive of ideas, of a purely ideic uh, factor as the cause, cannot work. Okay, this is, uh, this is a pure case of voluntarism and idealism, and of course, obviously, uh, disconnected from material changes, it cannot work. The same, and, and the other way around, also cannot work. Ideas take time to spread, absolutely. Christianity has existed for 2,000 years, Buddhism for another 500. So, I mean, how long should it? Christianity actually, you know, uh, proliferated very quickly. Took a few centuries, 
admittedly it took longer to get to end the way, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, I mean in the, uh, in the uh, Mediterranean world and then, uh, and then Northern Europe and then finally uh, getting to Northern Europe, to the, uh, to the Scandinavian and so forth. So it, it, it took a few centuries, uh, one millennium at the most, for Christianity to spread. And obviously during the Middle Ages or early modern uh, Europe, the uh, Christianist, Christianity was uh, vehemently against war, and yet, you know, nobody listened. Not because they were not exposed to Christianity, obviously they went to, the ch to church every Sunday and were preached, uh, and then they did what they, uh, you know, what they wanted. So, what we have to ask is why, over the past two centuries, okay, we see a change. Obviously, it's not connected to Christianity, there is uh, a decline in religiosity uh, in, in the developed world of a more or less parallel to, to industrialization. So, so we must ask what is it, what factor uh, was at work <coughs> during the past two centuries? And obviously there are some, uh, several suspects, but the process, the process so-called so modernization, which has industrialization at, at its core, comes to mind as the most obvious uh, suspect. Now it's you know, obviously when 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 there are such fundamental changes in the material world, it's, it's accompanied by, by also by changing of norms, changing of ideas. So constitute um, one whole the change of ideas and change of uh, material culture and so forth. So um, I don't think that uh, you know it was a matter of time until the 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 as uh, percolated or spread. Um, printing, obviously, <coughs> I think it's a major factor, and I think that uh, Pinker is right about it, but I remind you that Pinker cite printing as the cause of change with, within societies. Okay? He's asking why violence, why torture, why, uh, why uh, and other forms of, of uh, physical um, Violence declines within society from the early, from say, uh, uh, 1500 and, and particularly in the 18th century. Okay, it gives more or less the same reasons for the decline, for the further decline of war in the 19th and 20th century um, uh, trade, industrialization, um, uh, the liberal society, democratization, as, as we've just mentioned. Thinking, obviously. And, 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 an enormous change. Um, <coughs> industrial society obviously resting on earlier developments, not only printing but other, you know, the rise of commercial capitalism from uh, around 1500, the uh, creation of the first uh, um, uh, global market system, the great wealth <coughs> that is brought to the commercial classes uh, in Western Europe, and it wasn't the kings, it was the, it was the a commercial elite encompassing the aristocracy, very important in Britain, which made it their interest to further invest, advance the system. Okay, so in, in, in the case of Holland, the, the pioneer of the process in the 17th century was the um, commercial elite turning itself into a commercial aristocracy. In terms of Britain, it was the, the commercialized uh, aristocracy the gentry and other parts of the, and the upper aristocracy and also the, the bourgeois sucked into the process which, which made the country, which made trade the interest of the country by gaining control of, over the country. First unsuccessfully in the, the mid 19th, 17th century and then most successfully in 1688, after 1688. So obviously there were, there were preconditions for the process and uh, again, have to send the audience to the book. Um, Russia and uh, China. Why uh, is, is modernization, is industrialization in their case also means inevitably democratization? Obviously, uh, 
there is uh, the disconnection between modernization and democratization is not only one. Uh, Fukuyama, which I just mentioned, was only the last in the line. <coughs> My point, which uh, which I, I made in, uh, in that phone uh, the first article, was that uh, our our historical experience, which which uh, acts as the, the basis for uh, this, uh, of our generalization is a little bit skewed because of the 20th century experience. Now, in uh, a slightly different world, I, I'll make it specific what different world we, I refer to, a, diff, a world in which the United States had not existed. Say, the, this landmass was not there, was not there to be discovered by Columbus and that, you know, Europe was left to its own devices. Given, given that, assumption, Germany would have probably won both world wars. And then you would have had, had a different history, a different story of development to tell, a different grand narrative, and so forth. It's obviously, obviously legitimate to ask what would have happened to Germany, even if it, would, it had won, okay? Would it, would it, would it, have, it have become a, a liberal democracy if uh, if, uh, if Imperial Germany would have won in World War I, maybe, possibly, maybe you know, uh, more democratization over time. I doubt that it would have been uh, that it would have looked like the Western liberal democracies with their own traditions. Would Nazi Germany would have mellowed over time? Maybe there are such scenarios. Would it? Hey, would it? have become a liberal democracy with its uh, historical tradition and the, and the uh, legacy of success and so forth, I doubt it. But, yeah. Ah! <laughs> um, why it's important that the China and uh, why it's important that the world uh, avoids protectionism because if we take, say, China, China is uh, is, uh, has, uh, has little in terms of, of uh, natural resources and, and so forth. If it cannot uh, get them in, uh, in the market, and if it cannot buy them, it would, uh, well, I, I would not use the word inevitably, but it is likely, it, it is likely to expand in order to secure the resources. That's exactly what, hap what happened with Japan in the 1930s. After a period of liberal, liberalism in the 1920s and following the protectionist term that followed the, the, the Great Depression and the closing of the imperial steers, Japan felt that it was uh, you know, uh, being wronged. Uh, all, the others, all the other powers had the empires which they closed to Japan and uh, they told uh, Japan that uh, you are not allowed to have your own. Uh, we are sorry, this uh, game is closed. Unfair. That's how the Japanese felt, and I cannot say that I completely blame them. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you warmly, Professor Gott. Uh, we have to finish off because the Minister of Education is coming, so we have to be over at the canteen. At 5 o'clock, that's the reason that the conversation will continue there. Hobbes has been mentioned today, so maybe we should mention Immanuel Kant, so maybe we can flee. Towards perpetual peace, can we move there? Please, you have shown us some of the research basis for thinking in that way. Thank you very much, all three of you, for contributing. <coughs> Looking at the Bishop of Oslo, maybe it's right to finish by saying that we have to hope and pray for peace somehow, because we're not for sure of it. Now, I'll leave the floor to Christian, who will, together with King Esesbeck, our Deputy Director, finish off the proceedings in here, please. Thank you, Henrik, for taking us so ably through uh, today's uh, session. And, of course, uh, great thanks to uh, today's major contributor, Azargat, as well as to the two uh, commentators, uh, Jumon and Hovar Ege. You will not be only given a word of gratitude, as I got, you will uh, also receive a version of the Prio print, the anniversary print that we prepared for our 50th anniversary in, 
in, in 2009. The print is here. You get a version that it travels somewhat more easily. <laughs> but here you can see what it looks like. Uh, so thank you again for a great lecture. for uh, daring to disagree uh, with Azagat on uh, major points, on important points. I think this uh, contributed greatly to uh, the event today. It contributed greatly to the purpose of the annual peace address, which is to be stimulating, to inspire, to provoke, to inform the very agenda of uh, what we are involved in, namely understanding the nature of peace and war. So thank you to you for very good comments. Thank you also to Omar. We are aware, as I got, that you did not get the time that you deserved to answer the uh, wide range of uh, rather challenging questions. But I'm sure that you will continue to uh, reflect upon them. Some of them, I understand, you have answered in your book, even with 800 pages. I'm not sure you can have answered them all. <laughs> but we uh, will continue the discussion. We will move over to the uh, adjacent uh, 